This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geek show number 434, recorded on February 27th, 2020. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the Average Guy TV studios here. Beautiful mic. Like spring is on its way for sure, right? We're, we're, I'm loving it. I, 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 I welcome that with open arms. Kevin, you're a little farther north. Are you guys, uh, you still have snow on the ground? Uh, still have snow, but it's uh, getting a lot nicer here. Yeah. Yeah. Probably probably going to do a little ice fishing this weekend, and that'll probably be it for the uh, winter season. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of hoping this whole global warming thing's pretty great. I'm just going to be <laughs> honest with you. Like, for if you live in the Midwest, and listen, I've been through 30 Midwestern winters, and the early ones, like 30 years ago, were awful. When I first got here, I'm like, what have I gotten myself into? Um, and so with this latest trend, whatever it is, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with early spring. Of course, we will spring some show notes on you and there'll be and like for this show. I know I always say this, but Kevin actually has a lot of links tonight. So you're going to want to head out to the show notes, head out to the average guy.tv slash HGG home gadget geeks, HGG four, three, four, and you'll see all the links to everything we talk about. Well, most of the things that we talk about here tonight available as well. You can also join us live on our mobile app. And Kevin, you were really good when you were on the road all those years. You were really good about using this uh, free uh, Android iPhone uh, streams out to you. When we do this live, you get an automatic notification. The best way to listen to the show live if you're out on a Thursday night and you can't uh, get a hold of us. Sometimes it's hard to get in here and make all the technology work, but that app works every single time. HomeGadgetGeeks.com is the site to go to. And uh, you can get that downloaded. We want to thank our Patreon sponsors who do that, who sponsor us every single month. Mike, maybe the most faithful group of sponsors I've ever had because they just keep doing it and it helps pay for stuff. And so they keep we, doing that. They keep sending notes in. They, they, you know, comments. We love it. All the emails, we, we, we read them all. Jim forwards me a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, we love you faithful followers. Even just you normal guys who who don't uh, who yeah. don't subscribe or anything like that you guys if are all you guys are just a great community. Discord has been popping off too. Been loving that. No, it's been that has been fun to be with Kevin. Thank you for being on Discord as well and yeah. uh, and what you add to it. If you're on YouTube right now, you can subscribe to the live page if you want to do that. If you're on the recorded version, you can do that. Leave a comment in the comment down below, yeah. and I, I I do moderate those, but. And that goes um, into our chat, too, while we're live. The, the chat yeah. we're seeing is on YouTube. So if you're mobile as well, you can open up that. And that's another way you can do it mobile. This week, by the way, we appreciate that. So this week, uh, actually yesterday, I got, a, I, I got a tweet that was liked. But it was a tweet about Home Server Show 116 from, like, April of 2010. And I was like, and it was liked by our friends at Icy Doc. And I thought, what? So apparently, I, I, I don't know if this is for sure, but I think they got a new social media person at, at Icy Doc. Now, Icy Doc is a company we have followed since the early days of Home Server Show. I mean, this has been, they, they make incredible and awesome enclosures for hard drives, all kinds of converters, SSD converters. They'll take it to two and a half. They'll take it to three and a half. They've got, uh, they've got these um, fat cages that will allow you to put three drives in a two bay. You can get five drives in a three bay. Their stuff just works. Kevin, I, I'm sure you had a few IC Doc components in your time. I, I am beta testing something for them right now, and nice. I've, I've used a lot of them. And uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming I'm the only one who uh, enjoys this type of thing. But another thing at IC Doc's website is um, they have a um, proposed product area. It's products they haven't made yet, but they've kind of drawn them up. And if you like building computers and seeing what's out there from a feature set point of view, there's some really cool stuff out there really unique kind of designs. The, the the thing that could be a problem for IC Doc is a lot of their designs are based on having a five and a quarter inch bay open and a lot of new computers and cases don't have that bay. But uh, a, a cool thing they are prototyping is imagine a five and a quarter inch bay with two um, U.2 drives, so NVMe drives, three, uh, two and a half inch, 
and then twisted sideways would be four two and a half inch thin uh, SSD drives. So those would be like seven millimeter drives. So you basically you'd have six super fast drives in this little five and a quarter location. Yeah. Interesting. So I was just going to ask for you guys, for the guys who maybe haven't, my hand is raised here, uh, you know, haven't looked into IC Doc a lot. Obviously, if Mac guys, you could throw us in there because we haven't don't have a case to put them in. Um, so it seems to me like they're almost like adapters for drive storage or drive kind of mounting in a computer case. Yeah. Yes. Just okay. imagine any kind of any sort of adapter you would want. They've, they've yep. probably got it. They okay. have external enclosures that are, they have multi bay external enclosures. They have, you know, and the three and a half inch drive has gotten a lot less needed in the years we've been doing this. In the 10 or 12 years, Kevin, we've been out here doing this, talking about this stuff. But in this community, it's not. Um, there are certainly, I mean, as I talk to the guys who are, storing stuff they're still using spinning three and a half inch drives yep. and i've got 90 terabytes of spinning three and a half inch drives some i need to shuck some i don't um to get it done i've been thinking about kind of creating now that i've got this and and you know we're still mining we're still hard drive mining uh burst and and a bunch of other ones um eventually i'm gonna need to, i wanted to bring those kind of all into one server mm -hmm. and kind of make a monster rig out of it go ahead and i did see from that because you were talking about shucking real quick there was a video out i follow a guy on youtube called bite my bits um mm -hmm. and he actually tested he shucked um all of his drives for his unraid server and he actually had one go bad so he tested this was like this is my use case guys i shuck everything he buys all of those i mean tons of those western digital enclosures yeah. and uh, he sent it back to him what he got back it was interesting so he sent them i think just the drive I don't think he put it back in the enclosure. I think he sent it back just the drive. I could have that wrong. Uh, what he got back was actually, so he sent in, Jim, what are the versions you get? You get the WD. They're not the passports, right? Are they no, the- No, no, um, no. They're the easy essentials store? or the- Easy, the, easy store? Is that it? Easy Probably store, easy yeah. store. Yeah, yeah so, so. He, he had bought an easy store, sent them that in, and he got back the same size uh, with the passport. So they sent him the whole thing though, unshucked. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's what they sent them back to replace it. So um, they are honoring those warranties, even for shucked drives, which was, that was the thought. And that was the, that's what everyone, you know, with the new, there's uh, uh, the right to fix it yourself, right something like fix, that. Right, right to repair. Yeah. yeah, right to repair, right to fix with all of that. So it was an interesting test case to see that actually with shucked drives, you can, you can still get those replaced under warranty. Yeah. Um, Kevin, you and I, we've talked a lot about hard drives. I mean, <laughs> in the past, you've sent us over to, What's the what's the hard drive store that you uh, like? GoHardDrive.com was uh, very good for white label and OEM based drives for many years. Um, still some good deals over there. Yeah, well, it was so. Anyways, so IC Doc sent me this tweet, or they liked one of my tweets, so I just sent a note back. Hey, would love to consider doing some work mm -hmm. with you guys. It's you know it's twenty it's twenty twenty now. <laughs> we're, we're still talking about these things, and so they oh, yeah. asked they asked some questions about you know audience size and some of that stuff. Kevin, you obviously have a relationship with them, and mm -hmm. you're testing some stuff. They we talked about the 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 M dot two. They have an M dot two to to two and a half um, that has a dongle that goes on the back that you can plug into a port yep. on your drive uh, yeah uh, on the back of the motherboard or inside right there's a new i forget what it's called and so they're like hey you want to check this out i'm like actually what i'd really love is to really work on some of those fat cages because i kind of load up and at the same time i'm going to need more sata ports inside i'm going to have to probably replace the motherboard because i need to get 12 or 13 sata ports to make this thing work. Anyways, long story short, I want IC Doc USA to know that they've got some customers here at Home Gadget Geeks. So I'm gonna ask you, I don't ask this a lot. In fact, I've never asked anything like this. But if you're listening live right now, go to Twitter and I want you to just send a tweet to at IC Doc USA. Make sure you're getting the right one. I C Y D O C K. I see Doc USA. Send him a tweet. Just say, hey, I'm a home, home Gadget Geeks listener. Copy me on it. So at Jay Collison, so they know. And make it up whatever you want. I don't want to tell you exactly what to do because I don't want it to look like a, you know, kind of a fake tweet. But just tell them you're a listener. If you've been an IC Doc fan in the past, tell them. Tell them you heard about it on this show, on the first part of the, the live show here. We'd love to get, I'd love to get some traction going with them. 
they've always been, I've, I've had a soft spot in my heart for them. And I've had several enclosures. I, like I said, I'm running the fat cage right now. Um, I've been thinking of, uh, as I've, as I've been thinking about my, my crypto setup here, I've been thinking about buying some of their cages because I just really like them. So mm-hmm. love to pick them up as a sponsor in some form or fashion, love for them to kind of was spend the next six months or so talking about some of the stuff they do. Kevin, what you just mentioned that like, that's the future. You, you just talked about the future of storage, right. And and what you're, what you're testing for them. How's that, how's that working so far? Is that, and and what kind of use case are you using? Uh, very, very good. I'm, I'm just doing some late testing on it, uh, from it's, it's an M.2 type of product as well that I'm looking at with them. Uh, the uh, the other one I talked about they haven't shipped yet but um, you know everything they have kind of works I'm looking at this from kind of a virtualization workstation kind of point of view home lab kind of thing trying to get back into virtualization a bit because I my skills are a little rusty there mm-hmm. um, as you were talking about that Jim one of the one of the things I'll throw out about IC Doc is everything I've bought from them over the years and Mike was just talking about warranty replacement I've never had any of their stuff break. Yeah. Now, it, you know, it's not, it's not, act, most of their stuff isn't active. It's passive back planes and slide in slots and everything else. I've never had anything fail. I've never had anything break. Um, it's, uh, it's always been great product. Yeah. It, it's been, in fact, the, the, you know, I've, I've had a, a drive from them um, that would take two, two and a halfs and you could put them in there and it would turn it into one, three and a half. Right. And, in how oh, this was, man, this goes way back to home server show. And I pushed on it too hard and I broke the, the back plane on it. And I, you know what, if I had to probably just send them a note, I bet they would have sent me a new one. Like I, I just, I, I'm sure they would have at this point, even though it was my fault. So thanks, uh, Mike, uh, already, um, tweeted over there. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Follow that pattern. If you're listening live, just do it now. Don't, we're not going to talk about too much stuff important. Mike's going to give an update here in a second. And <laughs> we're going to um, and, and get that done. So I appreciate you doing that as well. Mike, you had, did you have a quick update from, from last week on the Mixer? Or do you want to do that in the post show? Um, I'd seen uh, reactions from the community yeah. on the mic and Mixer setup. You want to, is it quick or do you want to cover it in the post show? Yeah, it's real quick. I mean, essentially the, the end all decision for those of you playing along at home was I did end up returning the condenser. Uh, I decided that it was just a little too much work for my environment to to kind of get it to sound right, to eliminate the background noise and the air conditioner. But I did have a few of you reach out. Ben in Discord actually said he liked the sound better from the condenser, but that he agreed that in my environment, it might just be more of a hassle to deal with. And I don't think this ATR 100 sounds bad in any regard. I think it sounds pretty much just as good. So I'm not losing any audio quality, but I think him and I actually might play around with the EQ on this to see if we can maybe even tweak out a little bit more uh, audio quality. Jim and I both noticed that in the recording, it actually sounded better. That that condenser sounded a little bit better than it did when we were live, which was kind of interesting. And then uh, we already had someone, Keith Lunsford, hit me up on Twitter and said that he's already got the GoXLR mixer he great he went got the mini as well so i'm excited to to see how he utilizes it i i did talk to him i said you know what are you thinking and he goes well i spent the whole first night playing with just the lights and i didn't even plug in my mic yet and it's it's, there are so many fun options he hasn't even plugged in his mic but i think he's already enjoying it so yeah quick update um and I'll, i'll let you guys know how it goes in the future and if i decide to do any more um mic upgrades i'll let you guys know but we're back on the atr 2100 this week so all you audio listeners you know, you'll have to keep sending those notes on Discord. Let me know what you think of this week compared to the beginning of last week. Yeah. I, well, like you said, when I was doing the editing last week, I went back and listened to some chunks of it. I was like, actually, that sounded better recorded than it, I remember it live. Right. So, Kevin, you're using a... Uh, ATR 2500, yeah. twenty, And that's condenser, right, yes. as well? Yep. But you, So you have a fairly quiet area there, I would assume. It's it's fairly quiet, but if you hear some rumbling in the background, my uh, son is practicing the tuba down the hall. So uh, <laughs> I think when you had your door open and before yep. we went live, we could hear the boom boom. What boom, the boom. hell is that? No, we are trying we, to guess baritone or tuba. Is it is it with so a tuba? It is a tuba. Uh, it's a tuba. It, it is a yeah. tuba. Yes. Okay. Uh, one more update from last week. I'd mentioned to you guys I'd bought the Philips dimmer remote. Comes in a has a flat case that or a flat panel that you kind of taper or screw into the wall and it's kind of hard to see it's got some magnets there this just 
this uh, magnetically connects to it as well, and you have a dimmer for it. I had really hoped to use this, and I'd heard uh, uh, allegedly on YouTube that I could turn that into kind of a bridge, you know, my Philips Hue version one bridge kind of went offline, which was kind of weird. I heard there was an exploit for those version ones and you could, it would mimic it going down. And then when you went to reset it, it would exploit your network. I'm like, that's exactly what happened to me. So I don't know. I have nothing's gone wrong on the network and my pit defender router has, would probably have blocked any of that anyways. Yep. But I couldn't, um, as I tried to get this dimmer switch set up to the lights, it was all I could figure out is how to get them all the lights to do the actions that's on the dimmer. So on, brighter, dimmer, off, right? Those are the four switches that are on here. Really works better with the hub, <laughs> with the with the hub uh, and the app and stuff. And so I gave in and ordered the V2 uh, hub, Philips, Philips Hue hub, and that will be in tomorrow. We'll set that up. It works better with the app. I just kind of gave up. It was 35 or 30, maybe 40 bucks re, um, reconditioned or what else do we call that? When refurb. They, uh, refurb, there we go, thank you. So um, just an update. I thought I could make that work. I talked about it on the show last night. I just couldn't make it work with Hubitat. And, I, and, it, and I'm sure it does. It'll work a lot more natively when I get the hub in place and, uh, and go that route. So we'll uh, update on that. Kevin is here to talk a little bit about his move to a little faster internal network. Of course, Kevin, most of what you're going to say is going to go over my head and over <laughs> Mike's probably as well. But you have... Um, uh, t let's, let's go back a little bit. Give us a little bit about your journey and, and why, why, why go to, uh, to a faster internal network? Um, uh, good questions. I think it's, so anybody who uh, deals with Xfinity, like I deal with Xfinity knows that every two years you have to call and threaten to leave so that you get a halfway decent price out of them, which is never really a halfway decent price. Uh, and as normal practice with folks like them, it's they give you more than you really need. I don't necessarily know that I need gigabit uh, ether or internet at home, but that was that was the sell. It'll, we'll bump you on performance. You know, you're still limited to uh, you know. I think everybody's the t a terabyte per month uh, capacity limit. But uh, uh, and actually, I saw Dave uh, from uh, Reset was uh, run bumping into his limit. So you get those notices. What kind of got me going on the, the the thought process here was so I I hate renting modems. So I went out to buy a modem to save the seven to ten dollars a month they want for it. And now that I had uh, my gigabit performance, I needed a uh, Doxis, uh, was it Doxis 3.1, I believe is the spec I needed to hit to. Yeah. And uh, and picked up a new modem for that. So it's the uh, Xfinity or the Net uh, Nighthawk uh, CM1150V. Um one of the things I noticed in looking at the documentation, I actually read the documentation before I popped into it, was reminding me that, um, you know, uh, Doxis 3.1 is actually good up to 10 gigabit. So oh. it, th there is the potential there that we could be seeing 10 gigabit speed theoretically to your home. And of course, on the back of this modem, there's four Ethernet ports on the back, or I'm sorry, two Ethernet ports on the back because it's gigabit, it's probably gonna be more than gigabit. Actually, mine tops out at about 1.2, but that's faster than one gigabit port will handle. So you can team the two ports together. I've played with that a little bit. We'll get into that with the firewall aspect of it. But the underlying message with this is, uh, for years we've talked about um, multi-mode, multi-gig, N-base T. There's one gigabit ethernet, there's 2.5 gigabit ethernet, there's five gigabit ethernet, and there's 10. 2.5 and five haven't caught on very well, but now I'm starting to see things like, you know, this, this uh, as more people get gigabit inter internet in their homes, they're gonna need something faster. So will we start to see 2.5 gigabit ethernet ports on the backs of, um, uh, of the uh, modems? I think so. Um, are we going to start to see firewalls come with the 2.5 gigabit port on the front end of it? Well, I'd like to think so there as well. What's driving some of that move to 2.5 is, um, so probably my least favorite of net, uh, network guys is uh, the Realtek folks. 
and uh, Realtek is um, uh, offering up a 2.5 gig chip now at a very affordable price. So you're starting to see a lot of folks. Um, I ended up picking up uh, this card. It's a dual 2.5 gigabit Ethernet card for I think it was 39 bucks and works great. Um, connects to one of my switches that supports 2.5 gig. So we're starting to slowly see this adoption around 2.5 gig occur um, with, uh, you, if you look at some of the gaming motherboards, some of those are starting to come with 2.5 gig ports now. Uh, some of the, uh, you know, obviously ethernet cards here. I am starting to see as well that um, the, uh, some of the switches too so you can't you know you can't do much of this stuff without a switch and in the show notes i've thrown in a review on this one but um netgear has a uh, ms 510tx which has four gigabit ports two uh 2.5 gig ports two 5 gig ports and two 10 gig ports. One of those 10 gig ports is an SFP port as well. And I think this thing sells for about 250, if I'm not mistaken. There's a real nice review of it over on uh, Serve the Homes website. But for somebody who is looking for more performance, looking for more speed in their network, we're starting to see switches now come down into a price point that you know makes us affordable to jump into. Holy moly. You know, it, it gets me thinking, Kevin, I mean, as, as I'm in a, in a world and I have not internally, we've, it's funny that you mentioned this. We've actually in the last, on the past shows, have been talking about my internet connectivity problems. And usually it's rock solid. Cox has done some weird things. It's back. It's fine now. And I actually downgraded the service. I got it for cheaper and, and I'm at 150 down and 10 up. And so I could go gigabit. Uh, CenturyLink is being bringing fiber into the area here to mm -hmm. to kind of compete with that, and and, and I may consider doing that. But uh, Kevin, from an internal, you know, when I'm thinking, and I said this kind of mistakenly uh, early on here, but when we think about our internal network and moving, so not even leaving the house at this point, what, in your opinion, what's the advantage to going 2.5 or 10? just internally besides, I mean, don't you really have to have kind of a special use case of moving large video files around? I, I don't know too many other formats that create that much data. Uh, and, and maybe you could tell me different, but, but what's the advantage to having two and a half or 10? Or is it just because size matters? Uh, it, it's, in the end, <laughs> it's kind of a size matters thing. You know, well, my, the, the foot feet in my car goes all the way to the floor, but why the hell can't I drive that fast? Yeah. Uh, now, I do see cases if you're doing, and I, I always default to the one that I, I have a friend who does a lot of video editing, a lot of picture editing, and on his workstation, back to a NAS, we've crept up to, we, we just jumped all the way to 10 gigabit with him. Does he need 10 gigabit? No. But you know what? He doesn't wait for pictures to load anymore or videos to load. His projects all load just ultra, ultra fast. So it's looking for the bottlenecks, looking for, you know, where you have um, issues in your network. And if you're using a NAS storage device or a home server device of some time at ho a home, um, you know, I could make the argument, uh, if, if you look at the numbers of it, a regular disk drive will sustain about 150 to 200 megabytes per second transfer rates. Uh, a gigabit ethernet connection will sustain about 125 megabyte per second. So a single hard drive or SSD in a PC could saturate a gigabit port. So moving up to 2.5, say you've got a box that does some type of RAID or some type of caching on it. Um, you could argue that, that if you had, you were streaming media, sharing media, doing different things off from uh, a storage device, um, that's where I see the biggest gain is to not have any bottleneck, any pipeline issues there. I think I agree 100%. And especially, I think it's really important if you move up to gigabit internet, and let's say uh, user A is up in their you know room downloading a file. Well, it's going to max out. It's going to use as much speed as it can. So there's a gig, right? And if your switch, like especially if you have stack switches like me, right? You have your main switch and then maybe you have some offshoots. If someone has saturated that entire pipe, there's not much overhead left for the person watching Plex, uh, the person moving a file. So even just having that little bit of overhead, 2.5 would be more than enough. 
Um, I've actually been looking at getting a 10 gig card, just uh, not a switch, but just between my main machine here and my Unraid server. Mm -hmm. uh, but it gives you that breathing room for everyone else in the house for when someone all of a sudden right. maxes out that. Now, before gigabit internet, it's probably not too big of an issue in that case I just laid out because, like, for me, Jim, I actually just downgraded myself on Cox this weekend uh, down to 150.10. I'm on that same plan. So if someone maxes out a download, they're only going to take up 150 of the whole gigabit pipe. So I'm probably not running into any issues there uh, with someone trying to watch Plex in, inside the house. But, uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you, uh, Kevin. I think having that little extra room, jumping up a little bit, I mean, why not, right? Why not do it at this Absolutely. point? And Absolutely. I think especially with a $250 price tag. Now, was that switch managed that you were looking at? Uh, no, it's an unmanaged device. Okay. So that's, see, it, that's been my thing is finding managed. a good, affordable managed switch, especially because if you want to do any teaming uh, link aggregation, because the way I kind of do this on my Unraid box is I actually have three NICs with link aggregation because I run a Cisco switch. And so that Unraid box has three gigabit of pipe to it now obviously all my computers can only access one gig bit at a time but coming from different locations it could use up to three mm -hmm. if it needed to so if i have multiple users trying to write files to it it's it's never going to have a bottleneck there so um you're gonna you're gonna make me jump ahead in my in my stuff here <laughs> but uh so I, I, I'm, I was so excited when I saw the notes for this because I've been thinking about doing the exact same thing in my house. So I'm glad you're going to walk me through kind of your experience with it. So, so I can, there, uh, there's a company, Microtik, who a lot of the networking yeah. guys know uh, out of Eastern Europe. Um, I'm still amazed at this. Um, Serve the Home did a review of it, and hopefully it's up on the screen now. Um, it's a new switch from them that is 48 one gigabit ports, just plain old one gigabit ports. It is four 10 gig ports uh, with SFP connections. And then it is two 40 gig ports. And for those who understand 40 gig, 40 gig uses what's called a quad SFP. So you can run it from a 40 gig NIC, or you could break that out oh, into four okay. 10 gigs. So it gives you some flexibility there. And amazingly enough, Apparently, this switch is going to sell for five hundred dollars. Wow! Now, does anybody need forty gig at home? No, probably not. But talk about. <laughs> but I want it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I want this. I yeah. Want now that I know it's it. there. Oh, geez. Now I was going to do ten gig. Now that's just a you know. Uh, it's this is small just stuff compared brilliant. to forty. Wow. Well, and if I move over to once again uh, later in this, I was going to talk a little bit about how cheaply you can move to four uh, to ten. Um, I've been a fan of uh, so Aruba, the wireless vendor uh, owned by HP. Now they have um, the, they obviously sell switches to coordinate all of their um, uh, wireless access points out there, and they're uh you know moving towards multi-gig as well but it's becoming very popular in the uh you know networking community to buy their older switches lifetime warranty lifetime support for free so this is a 24 port poe switch so one gig ports at 24 or 24 one gig ports with poe um four 10 gig ports off in a little card off to the side here this one happened to come with dual power supplies and this was uh, a whopping $75. Oh, I'm so, spending $75 right now. So if you, um, <laughs> I, no, this is the lowest I've ever seen these. And there's great over at, uh, I'll probably reference uh, Serve the Home. Uh, those guys, uh, they've got a couple of guys who've done, you know, you kind of need to jump into the switch and tell those um, 10 gig ports, hey, you're not uplink ports anymore. You're your regular ethernet ports. So there's a little bit of config to do with it, but it's it's not that difficult. But it is managed. It, that is a fully managed switch. Yep. I'm I'm about to spend seventy five dollars. <laughs> so, so look at that one. That's the best you've hey, ever doc. seen. Hey, I see Doc. See how <laughs> easy people spend money. Yeah. Just Especially the, the co-hosts of the show. Uh, yeah. Well, you're the worst for sure. I know. Sometimes. So, so Jim, another thing popped into my head when you were hey, talking about Kevin. Hold on. Before you do that, hold that thought for just one second. Let me bring this up. So, the twenty four port switch that I bought two years ago for, and I think it was a screaming deal at ninety bucks then. It's 70 bucks now. This is the, you're kind of your standard mm -hmm. 24 port gigabit ethernet, which up until tonight was just perfectly fine for Uyghur. <laughs> and now it's not. 
but it's interesting, you know, 75 bucks for that in a little configuration, that's more of a, a hardcore tech guy, but you know, wow. All of a sudden, you know, you kind of go, man, the, the gigabit days are, I guess the gig internally, the gigabit days are over. Yep. Now, one thing to keep in mind with a switch like that is the 10 gig ports are SFP. So you'll mm -hmm. have the added cost of buying transceivers and transceivers aren't always compatible. So it is a big thing to go and check of. So the transceiver I'm buying for this Aruba switch, is it compatible? Is the transceiver I'm buying for the network card? Uh, so on the other end, um, I really like uh, Mellanox is a very good uh, 10 gig ethernet card in the, um, in the enterprise. And you can get Mellanox uh, connect three cards for about 35 bucks. Um, so buying transceivers from either end can run into a little bit of money, but there's also direct attach cables, which is a, you know, if you, if you don't have to go a very long distance, you can forget about fiber and use these direct attach cables that have transceivers already soldered on the ends. So they, they, that tends to be a route to go. So the switch is cheap. The other stuff will probably set you back something. Although I've noticed lately that, um, and you can buy um, transceivers that convert to an RJ45. So if you do have an, a 10 gigabit card that uses traditional uh, Cat6A wiring and supports RJ45s, you can go that route as well. And what actually Serve the Home has been doing a series of reviews on those as well. Uh, just a thought, Jim, on what you were saying too about your home network is, um, and I'll get to this in a little bit on, on wireless, is and what Mike was saying about different users streaming and downloading things. Um, if you only have like one access point in your house or uh, in a few minutes, I'll beat up on mesh networking because I'm not a fan um, is if a lot of your users are tied into one of the uh, mesh devices, you're going to soak that guy dry. You know, you're just going to suck that guy dry. So with um, wireless access points, it gives you the ability to have a gigabit port to each of the access points, have those scattered through your house so that you can kind of break them up by rooms and usage areas where people use. And you can balance out your network much better from that point of view as well. So, but, but not as convenient, right? I mean, then you're, are you moving in between SSIDs when you're doing that or nope. flat oh. SSID through the, the okay. whole house and um, the, that transfers. Okay. I mean, this is mm -hmm. okay. Right. Cause that's what in the early days of this, this was the problem, right? The yep. handoffs never worked very well. The hand, the handoffs and roaming were awful. Yeah. And what's come together now is uh, all these guys kind of figured out that unless you're in the enterprise and deep in the enterprise, nobody's going to pay money for a, a wireless access point controller anymore. It's all done through software or it's cloud-based and you got to give it away to get it out the door. So now everybody is doing, you know, unless you're Cisco or Aruba or some of the high-end guys, you, you know, you're, you're not going to get anybody who's going to pay for an access point. So Joe, Joe makes a good comment and he says the old saying, uh, nobody ever gets fired for buying Cisco unless, of course, it's for home and the significant other finds out what you spent for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually run my Cisco switch. I got it on eBay for $30. It's a 48 port POE managed Cisco switch for 35 bucks because it doesn't have a face plate and has mm -hmm. a big dent in the top. But hey, it still works. Like gigabit. you plug it in. Oh yeah, gigabit. Yeah, gigabit. And I think I think the two there are four fiber port if SFP ports. Um I've actually never checked if those are 10 or one. Uh my biggest problem is is the command line on Cisco is for a guy who doesn't do it in his day job is not fun to work with. Yeah. And it's, there's no support now, right? Like, cause I don't have a contract with them. So right. upgrades, things like that don't happen. No, it's a, it's, it's a bit tough. Um, so switching back for a minute, that whole yeah. 2.5 gig, um, ethernet connection, uh, stumbled on to, and the storage guys are coming along slowly. Uh, Asus has a storage division that builds NAS products, uh, actually quite nice NAS products. Um, their higher end units are all starting to come with two 2.5 gigabit ports, which you could uh, link aggregate to five if you wanted to. Um, QLogic is offering up 10 gig ports on some of their stuff. So that's a, a nice jump as well. Um, for your, the storage uh, guys who like to play with stuff, um, this is a little company who does like open source ARM based products. They partner with a couple of Linux vendors. They partner with um, uh, Open Media Vault and they have a little ARM board here with uh, 2.5 gig ethernet on it. 
and uh, they're doing a, um, uh, a first production run on this product. Uh, it's a tiny little box, um, basically holds five hard drives. I think the whole works is under 400 bucks for the whole thing. Um, you can either buy the board and do projects with it. Um, what caught my interest in this board is it is a nano ITX form factor with five SATA ports on it. And surprisingly, it will actually fit in, Jim, you remember the old HP media servers? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. This, this board will physically fit in there. I'm still really? trying to figure out how to do the cabling, <laughs> but uh, um, we, we, we might have a rebirth of the old media servers. Oh, my gosh. Board and uh, drive cage or just the board? I would just do the board. Just okay. do the board and try to cable into the existing drives there. Okay. Okay. So back back to my internet stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. My yeah, next yeah. my next big thing was uh, obviously I'm on gigabit uh, internet now, and it, what's it's what's that while. costing you, Kevin? <sighs> it's a big bundle. I I, I okay. want to say it's I want to say it was the whole thing with cable and everything else. I, I want to say the internet come out to be like seventy a month or sixty a month or something okay. like that. That's not too bad. But it's but it's not buried. And no, is that gigabit up and down or just down? Just down. It's about 30 up. Yeah. That, that's, yep. that's what Cox is here too. That drives me nuts. <laughs> that just drives me nuts. Why, why does it have to be that way? Like I need up. I don't care about down. I mean, I do, you don't. So you should, when you mentioned earlier about um, charter offering fiber, a lot of the fibers are uh, full. Uh, they are. They what, are. what you get down is what you get up. Yeah. And it, it's yeah. just in how they kind of lay out their circuitry. I so. think I need to wait for CenturyLink to run their fiber. And I think they're running it right now. There's a big project going on on Harvell Road, which is mm -hmm. what comes into Bellevue. And and I think I, I see them running blue and orange conduit. You know, they go in there and they, you know, they run it down through. And I think that's the fiber coming in. So I have to keep keep tabs on them. But it's just frustrating to get 10. Like, and I can't buy more. I have to get on a crazy commercial plan to get any more. You yeah. know, and you're like, hey, uh, you, you know, 100 would be great. I don't even need a full gigabit. 100 would be awesome. So. You know, and I'm, I, I'm here in the Twin Cities. I'm right between, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in Cottage Grove, which is just south of Woodbury. Woodbury is one of the largest, fastest growing um, suburbs in the metro area. And I have one choice, and that's Xfinity. That's my only choice here. Now, luckily, I, I have a choice to get really fast. But, you know, we, for, for it being 2020, we still don't have that great of offerings across major metro areas. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's so, this is when we talk about the digital divide. And now this, these are these are total first world problems. OK, oh, yeah. So let me just say, like for me to gripe about not being able to get gigabit when there's places in the country that can barely get 10 down. Right. Yep. A lot of rural areas and stuff like that. So I kind of feel bad. But darn it. I, I want it. <laughs> I <got> it. <laughs> Let's talk about me. <laughs> it's all about me at this point. But anyways, all right, Kevin, keep going. So obviously the next thing from an upgrade path here is uh, my old, you mentioned Cisco. I was running a Cisco uh, uh, small business uh, firewall um, just because I was stalling to move to something else. Uh, I'd used an old uh, Zizel uh, USG20 for many years, had good luck with that. Yep. And so I, I went back to uh, our good friends at Untangle. And, uh, you know, Mike has mentioned it many times. I used it years ago. I um, was blown away at how clean and easy the install was. Um, I will give a little, uh, I've got it running on an older HP Pro 3000 PC, which is, uh, it's like a Pentium Q9500. So it's a quad core Pentium. And uh, you know, obviously it doesn't hardly tap the CPU at all. Uh, I've got eight gig of memory in there. It's using about 30% of that. I've got everything turned on right now. Um, I honestly wasted more time farting around getting that old PC tweaked and tuned and running, uh, kind of the diminishing returns deal. I had a nice quad port uh, HP Ethernet card in it until um, I realized the PC wouldn't boot because it didn't have enough space to load the ROM for that card. So I pulled that out <laughs> and put a dual port in it and <clears throat> got it running. It's very stable. Uh, but that that uh, the new... Um, uh, you know, guide for installing and setting up Untangle is so easy. And Mike, I don't know if you did, you know, I just basically turned everything on and yep. hooked it up and it's cooking away. It does. And, and I, 
more and more, the more I use it, the report function on there is actually, I mean, it seems a little daunting at first, but it's super easy. I needed to know yesterday for some reason, look to my Cox because I've been trying to see if I can get rid of my unlimited data addition to my internet, which is 50 bucks a month. So yesterday I had a lot more data than I thought. You just go in there, do a report on bandwidth control. Uh, it can tell you by host name, right? Which was great. So then I said, oh, oh, wow. Well, this computer used a ton. Then I switched it over to the by application and it said, well, here's the port. And it was actually, you know, open VPN, whatever it was. I'm like, well, well, something's using the VPN. Maybe it shouldn't be. And, you know, I was able to, you can just search through all that data and it keeps it for so long that even if you realize, oh, last week I had a problem looking back through all that data and you're right, the usability of it, um, being able to run a VPN server on there, which I use to connect back to my home, but also a VPN out. So you could either run your whole network through a VPN or it's got super smart rules for, hey, when this host is online, send him through the VPN, please. So yep. if you have that one friend who always comes over and is doing shady stuff on your network, you could just tell it, hey, every time he comes over, send him through the VPN, Open right? Um, just extremely cool functionality. And I, I, I don't know if, I mean, if you're like me, I find something new in there every once in a while. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I had no idea that even existed. I, uh, I, uh, just to try it out, I, uh, tried to go to a few of those off color websites and it, it blocked them in a very yep. polite fashion. Um, <laughs> I think I you can change I, that screen too, to say some different stuff. It'd be pretty funny. I've thought about <laughs> freaking out some people. When you mentioned the, the, when I saw, um, uh, the VPN and how easy it is to set up a site to site B VPN between two of them kind of back to that storage thing again, is putting a storage box at your location and somebody else's location, all of a sudden, you know, back to the 30 up and the hundred yeah. down, mm -hmm. um, it becomes more reasonable of an idea to mirror storage between locations, yeah. you know, f set up the first mirror locally before you pop things over. But, uh, you know, and, and another thing with going with the untangle here is now I've got plenty of ports. So I'm on a gigabit port right now and I can saturate that. I'm still playing around a little bit with the configuration to do two of the gigabit ports uh, through the teaming to make sure I get the utmost out of this box. Um, but it, it, it does, um, over the years, if you haven't caught on to it, I'm, have been for years, the, the three networking kind of guy, firewall separate, switch separate and wireless access point separate. It just, it, I know it's probably more expense, but we'll get into that in a minute where maybe it's not. Um, and you know, it just works better for me. I like to block things up that way. Uh, a good router, there's nothing wrong with a good router, but I, I still like the idea of having all these things separate so you can tweak and tune them and have them be just as you like them to be. In that vein, one of the concerns I've had is, you know, you almost run into this thing these days where it's difficult to um, find reasonably priced standalone firewall router type products. So untangle selling their appliance or you putting it on a PC yourself is a, is a nice way to go. I almost went for this, but I didn't want to wait for it. Um, for the guys out there, there's a company called Firewalla. It's a bunch of ex uh, Cisco guys. Their initial products were these little inline cubes that you could put um, in line in, in bridge mode between your modem and your router or on the other side if you preferred. And it just gave you some extra security reporting and functionality. Um, they have an Indiegogo uh, Go -Go page right now for a real firewall product. So it will do routing and everything. Um, four Ethernet ports and a console, and I think they're doing them for 375. Um, these guys are promising, at least for I want to say one year or two years, of free updates for them. So, keeping you know, look always looking for that. Hey, I just want a good, reasonably priced firewall that um, supports the features and functions that are more family home related than say small to medium business related. Um, it was pleasant to see somebody else jump on the scene with the with the firewaller guys. So, with your rig um, that you're running, how much power do you know you're drawing? I do not. That's a good okay. question. Because uh, I, I thought really mine was a lot that. more than it was. Uh, I was running an i3 Dell Optiplex. I was like, geez, that thing's got to be pulling a lot. I put the meter on it, 20. Yep. 20 watts. And I mean, that's not terrible. It's not good by any means, right? But it, it's just two light bulbs. Yeah. Two incandescent light bulbs. That, that's what I figure. And so yeah. I had actually been playing around with virtualizing that in Unraid. I'm like, you know what? With the 
with all the hassle virtualization causes when you take down Unraid, then the whole internet goes out. Like 20 watts isn't really that bad. Right. I mean, I think it's less than, you know, in Omaha, at least where we're at, the prices for energy are pretty cheap. It's like a dollar a month, I think, to run that thing. Not mm-hmm. terrible. Yeah, it's not like an old Cora i7. I had an old Xeon, Kevin. You sent me some memory for that back in the day. And I think it was a dual Xeon. And yep. man, that, that thing was like 470 watts. Oh, yeah. To be a, be a cool cat in those days, we were all running uh, Dell and HP workstations. Uh-huh. And those things were tanks. Yeah. Huge, huge Xeon monsters with lots of very hot memory in them. I, I talked about that on the show here. And Kevin, I got a note from Kevin the next day. He's like, hey, I got some memory for you. Don't do not do anything. I will send it to you. And I think you sent me 64 gig in there. And we fired that thing up. And I could really only, my tree hugging self could really only <laughs> run that server for about a couple of weeks. And I felt so guilty. I'm like, I can't, this can't, this doesn't work. Now, later would I, you know, start running a mining operation in the yeah. house of GPUs. But one server at 470, I think it was 470, something like that, 460, yep. 470 watts. Kevin sent me two hard drives that I'm still using in my own red box, like nice. five years ago. Uh, I, think, I think they were, what, Thank they you, were enterprise drives. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Sam. I know. It was it was something, I think I mentioned it, and you're like, I have some extra drives, and those are still running strong. One's my parity disk, yeah. and one's still running. I, I And I always, when I have those, I tend to be a little that was when i had a friend working at wd and those he would always mm. hand pick the best engineering samples he got back that he felt comfortable giving away because some engineering samples get abused pretty nasty mm-hmm. um so th- those were always a good hand-picked kind of ones. yeah they so, run great they've been running kevin, for five years strong kevin i've always just appreciated your generosity to the to the community you know we've been we've been doing this now i think i, t- I mentioned at the top of the show we've been doing this together for 10, 11 years now, and I've just always appreciated your generosity. So thanks for that. And really, that mirrors the community here. Like, I, I just have never, I've never been in a community that's just so giving and so willing to share. And when people need things, it's just like, can I just ship it to you? Kind of basically, or 20 bucks, you know, type deal. So I always appreciate that. So here, here, here's a Mike Rieger's trivia question for the evening. Oh, My first appearance on Home Gadget Geeks what was the product that I was there to talk about? And Jim barely knew me and allowed me to come on and talk about the wonders of this new product. Oh man. I mean, it's not the typewriter, right? It's uh, It's how long has Jim's been podcasting? It's it's (laughs) Jim's a seasoned podcaster. No. um, Oh, I I don't know if I even have any guesses. Uh, This was the launch of uh, why I preferred windows phone for work (laughs) and how well it integrated with our exchange server at work and i could have three or four calendars all together which is easy to do now but at the time this was revolutionary stuff this uh, windows phone thing which uh what year was that oh boy i'd have to go back and look it's a long no i'm trying to find the i'm even trying to find the show it's got to be probably 2012 might even be before, before that. that. Yeah. Oh, I, I, it was probably 2007, 2008. Well, like that would be on home server show then. Cause we, we didn't start here till 2010. Well, then it would have been right around there. Maybe then kind of time frame. That could have been a surface geeks thing too. This was here on the show. Yeah. Okay. You keep talking. I'm going to find this show. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just a, Quick thing about Untangle and Mike, you talking about, you know, trying to save power. I'm a, I don't know if I can get this on the picture well, but I'm a big fan of these little small form factor HP and Dell makes a nice little one. This is HP's ultra, uh, what do they call it? Uh, ultra small desktop enclosure. And I thought, God, it would just be great if I could get two more ethernet ports in that sucker. And I finally stumbled onto something that may come to fruition someday. Um, I'm still working it out here, but there is a company, uh, Siba is one of them, that makes a dual port NIC, if I can get the right side of it here, that fits in a mini PCI connection. So all these little guys have um, a slot for a wireless card, and this fits in that slot. The really? Problem, uh, the problem I've run into, uh, and then you have a couple little cables here that go off to a, another little board that uh, is your um, back uh, port out of the system. So you get this little guy hangs out the back of the system. Jim, can you show his screen? 
my screen or his screen? Sorry, there we go. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, I, was, I was looking for the show. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> so you get this little dual port deal that goes out the back of the box. Um, you'd want to take it off this and you'd probably have to modify it for one of these low profile chassis. Gotcha. So it's not sitting in a slot. You would take right. off that bracket and it's, it's usually hanging external to the machine. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then this is the little, uh, the little board that uh, goes in the uh, mini PCIe slot. The problem I've run into is uh, like on the HPs, this thing is packed so deep under other stuff. There's no room to get the cables out. And the closest I've found is I've got a Dell um, 790 here that is um, appears to have room. I might have to modify the motherboard a little bit to get enough space in the front there. But um, I, I threw a link in the show notes for it. It's 25 bucks. So, you know, if uh, Lenovo, I haven't tried every combination, obviously, but if you, if you find some of these small boxes like this that have that slot for Wi-Fi, which goes right down on the board, and there's some opening around it, um, it this, I think this is kind of a neat way to add um, two more ports to one of these little chassis, and it'd make a great firewall. You know, low power, um, small size, uh, easy to work with. Definitely. Okay, I have it. I, I think it was. Oh, those are the show notes. Hold on, let's let's go. Okay, I think this is it. Home net. So this is funny. This is March second, twenty thirteen, and what are we talking about? Home, home networking. networking. Like some of the same words you've been using seven <laughs> years later, Kevin. Like, so this was you, Greg Welsh, Bill Pullman, Rennie Phipps came on. We were doing roundtable discussions in those days, and we'd done a four part series just on home networking and everybody was bringing their home networking diagram. And Kevin, there is yours right there, <laughs> which it's just like, this is awesome that we've died, you know, that we've collected this information over this length of time, right? This is seven years ago and, and almost to the day in some regards, I mean, it's February 27th. This was June. I'm sorry. This was March Third, it was it was probably March first yeah, by the time I got it posted. But so we're pretty close to it being exactly seven years ago, and here we are talking about networking, right? <laughs> I mean, how cool is that? So, um, Kevin, you had your diagram. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I think you can get to this the Average Guy TV slash HT because we called it Home Tech in those days. That's right. HT one oh seven is I think what will get you there. Um, but we had um, Kevin. You had your network. Bill listed out his network, which was cool. Rennie put together his network and Greg diagrammed his network. So how cool is that? That uh, That's still was, out there. Was draw.io a thing? I think Greg and the guy right above Greg used draw.io because that, that one right there, I think that's a standard template because that's how mine's diagrammed. That's like the exact three like column format that I have mine in. If it's probably, maybe if draw.io was a thing back then. Kevin, I looked for the Windows Phone reference, and it must have been something we talked about post-show or at the end of the show or something like that. But man, some really good show notes for this. Oh yeah, for this one hundred and seven. I think this may have been in the days when Andrew put these together for me. He would mm. Andrew Morris came on here for a lot of years and was was doing that as well. So so, okay. so my drawing is definitely a Visio drawing. I was able to find uh, most of my logos and images and everything. Yeah. But... How how many of these things? Let's see. I wonder if I can. I wonder if can I can make it bigger. Yeah. Hold on. Let me see if I can blow this thing up here. Um. Oh, if the thing goes away to, can you, no, I'm not going to mess with it. Yeah. Kevin, as you look at this thing, how many, are you, is any of this still in place? Uh, two of the You're, printers are. Okay. I do see, I see two HP microservers there. Uh, they'd the be mix. different microservers today. Actually, I think uh, I've got an IO safe in there and that is still running. Okay. I, I see an N40L and, an, and a 36L. Yeah, those are those are sitting on the bench. Uh, still have them. St don't I, I use them. I finally took mine to recycle. <laughs> My N40L went to recycle. So, uh, a good blast from the past. Absolutely. Uh, no. Yeah. Absolutely. No, a good blast from the past. Okay, back to you. What else? Uh, what's next? Um, you know, so I I enjoy participating on forums, uh, helping people out. Um, Sonos, the speaker forum is one I spend a lot of time on and, um, 
the majority of the problems people have with Sonos is their network, uh, not um, anything to do with Sonos. It's more about networking. Um, and I stumbled across, we've had a few of them over the years, but this is a package um, uh, for testing Wi-Fi. And it is very robust, uh, gives you good ideas of signal strength. You can put it on a laptop and walk around the house with it. Um, it's good to have a, maybe an external USB uh, Wi-Fi connection so you get like the latest, greatest performance because uh, you, know, you, you want it to match what you're broadcasting from your wireless access points. Um, but this is one I recommend to folks who have networking issues and are trying to resolve. Are they having channel conflicts with the neighbors? Are they running into interference? And, you know, it, and the thing I commonly find is everybody believes just because they can connect to their wireless, that their wireless is, is really good. And mm. it's not necessarily really good. Um, which, uh, you know, brings me to, and, and it, I don't want to beat up on mesh too much. Um, I think I've, I've played it with some mesh systems. I haven't used them in full production here at home, but I'm, I, I continually run into more and more issue. I'll pick on, uh, or Orby and Eero and those guys, those guys, products are great for coverage. You know, if you have trouble getting Wi-Fi signal all over your house, those guys are great for getting Wi-Fi signal all over your house. But they they have problems with throughput. They have problems with latency. And frankly, the router functions in them tend to not impress me too much. And, and especially with like Eero, um, I, I occasionally run into things where home automation hubs, um, like the Philips hub or, um, oh, Jim, what's the cameras you were using um, that had their own hub with it? Uh, well, the, I have the Ring. Uh, uh, I've got the the um, in the back. They are Zmodo. Yes, yes. So their hub would do this weird thing where it would try to connect to every one of your Eros because it thought it was a router by itself uh -huh. because they kind of distribute the router function. Um, so I, I just have run into... Yep, with mesh, you can get great coverage. You can get Wi-Fi all over your house. But in the end, you tend to, you know, is it, do you get the bandwidth you expect out of it? Do you get the performance? The devices all talk to each other. So commonly, the end result is, hey, to get best performance out of your mesh network, you should really hardwire each of the units. Well, if I'm going to hardwire each of the units, why don't I just go with regular wireless access points? <laughs> right. Because because if cabling, and I know cabling can be an issue, cabling can be a problem. And of course, wireless access points, um, you know, have come way down in price. You know, it used to be good wireless access points for a couple hundred bucks. Then they dipped down into the 150. They hovered about 125 for a long time. Um, I bought into D-Link a few years ago out of the seeing their um, AC 1200s were, uh, this is quite a few years ago now, they got down to like 89 bucks. So I bought three of them. And the other thing that pushed me over, Jim, to your comments earlier about handoffs and that, um, they, like other people, had offered up their um, central Wi-Fi function for um, uh, free. So you, you could uh, um, use their uh, application product for free and have it all running. Uh, so I went that route. Um, what I threw in the notes here, too, is if, if I was jumping off... so. Been happy with D-Link, although I just went to add a couple of wireless access points and I realized that uh, it's a learning curve. You got to kind of jump back into their controller and kind of, if you're not doing it every day, it's kind of a little difficult to work with. Um, but if I were looking at jumping into wireless access points today, Ubiquity is a safe choice, real easy, safe choice. A lot of people use it, easy to work with. But if I was testing today, I think I'd give uh, the TP-Link guys a shot. I've heard a lot of good stuff about their wireless access points. Um, AC1350, their EAP225 uh, sells for $59 a piece. And they offer um, in on the uh, Discord site, we talked a little bit about uh, extending Wi-Fi outside. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. There it is. For $69, they offer 
a outdoor version that is all sealed and is weather resistant, weatherproof, uh, durable. Um, so, you know, at, at, um, if you can run the network, um, cables and if you have the placing for it and it's not too hard to place this stuff out and you can kind of get creative with running through walls and, um, through attics and such. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of wireless access points. Um, and I just wanted to point this one out because it, it was very tempting recently. I was thinking maybe it was time to move off the D-Link and onto something else, but it's been so stable and so good. And frankly, I just picked up a couple of used uh, models of the exact same access point for 25 bucks a piece. So, you know, I can have a little buffer inventory there. And, uh, and like the rest of these guys, the... Um, uh, the software package for it, their EAP controller is a free centralized controller. So throw it on a PC or put it in a virtual machine and you can be up and running and that manages all your handoffs and, uh, and such. Um, for folks who maybe, oh, go ahead. No, well, so here was my question. I just, cause well, mainly cause I just saw it there. Uh, there's been some rumblings through like the network community that, you know, the MU MIMO, so multi-user MIMO, is more of kind of a marketing ploy now because multi-user MIMO actually doesn't work very well compared to regular MIMO. Have you have you seen that that's true while you've been doing your research here? Like, are, are companies charging more for MU MIMO devices than it's just standard MIMO? I, I, at one point they were. It was like, so all this kind of gets back to whose chipset you're using. So. Okay. Uh, almost all of these inexpensive products are Qualcomm chipsets. And if you look at uh, what TP-Link sells, it's likely kind of the standard Qualcomm design. So initially there were two different chipsets and to get the upper end of the features, it was more money. Now I think it's just kind of rolled down into being their standard from a price point. point okay. of view. So you're not overpaying for a, for a feature that's not the best anyway. Yeah, I, I don't right. think so anymore. But yeah, it is a valid point because initially people really, you know, the 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 um, interest around or the features of that were kind of blown out of proportion, maybe. Uh, it was very yeah. alluring to have this. But then you had to sit back and go, well, wait a minute. My device that's connecting to it has to support the same thing. Right. to be able to take advantage of it. And does my new laptop have that? Will my new laptop have it? So I, I think that just kind of turned into a bit of uncertainty uh, around the, the technology there. Interesting. Kevin, can I go back to this device that yes. you threw up here? Um, yes. I'm a, can I just, so it says download here. Yep. This, this is software. the, yeah, this is just the software, right? This is the Wi-Fi analyzer. So available for Windows 10. Can I just put this like on my Surface Pro and and use it because it's a Wi-Fi device? I'm assuming yep. you it needs to be on Wi-Fi and then you're going around and it's measuring things, right? Absolutely. Yep. Free software, free download. Free software, free why, download. Why wouldn't I have this piece of software on my Surface Pro? To I, I can't think of any reason okay. not. It's, it, <laughs> you, you, we kind of breezed through it and I was like, yep. hey, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I was just helping somebody in the stream yard. Um, Facebook group, they were their video was stuttering, and I was a little sensitive to that after a couple of weeks ago yeah. when my video was stuttering. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, okay, have you checked like what's your up and down? And they dropped a speed speed test in there, and they, they were getting plenty. And I said, okay, let's check, um, let's just check your CPU utilization, right? And now they were they were on a Mac, they were fine, and I didn't want to say like because I knew they were Wi-Fi and I wasn't going to be that guy that's like, yeah, you can't do this over Wi-Fi, <laughs> but you know, I needed to be that guy. So good timing on this, this now, yeah. this wouldn't have helped them, but you know, Hey, go put the software on a piece of equipment and, and then, <laughs> you know, run it. But this could be a cool little tool. This is the first time I've seen this of kind of seeing, especially if you're in a big house and yep. on reset, McCabe talks about this all the time, right? He's got dead zones. He's got, yep walls to get through he's got concrete foundations he's always constantly kind of thinking about you know how do i get the right access points where i need to get them you could walk around with this right and I, and it would tell you what the signal strength is and it yep. looks pretty simple 
it, it, it's very simple. It'll tell you signal strength. Um, you, you, there's lots of graphs and things down on the bottom. And, and frankly, this is one where I have had cases where, like I say, people complain about how something works and they know they got great Wi-Fi, got great Wi-Fi everywhere. And you get them to try this and walk around the house with it and they go, oh, wait, my Wi-Fi is not so great. Mm. The other thing you will find with this that a lot of people don't realize is one of the biggest walls or deterrents to Wi-Fi is the human body. Mm. So if you're standing between your access point and your laptop, um, it will block quite a bit of signal. And you, you quickly find people say, well, it as, as I was walking around the house, it kept changing. Well, where's, the, where's your access point? Where's your router? Where are you? Where's your laptop? So you, you, yeah, you might want to make sure you have a direct line that yep. you're not in the direct line, yep. right? So, so yeah, okay. think, think about where you are and where, and where that's, yeah, uh, that's, for. I'm going to, I'm going to, this weekend, I, I love to, to, to install these kinds of things. I have one, you know, I have a Bitdefender router and it's the Wi Fi for the house. And to be honest, we don't have a ton of stuff that's Wi Fi that's mission critical. It's our phones. Mm -hmm. It's the Amazon devices. It's the few. It's the couple of the Google devices that we have. I'm trying to think, we probably have more than that, but nothing where it matters. Although, when the Wi-Fi went down the other day, you know, it got really cold, and then our 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 up speed went to crap. Alexa, oops, the Amazon device. <laughs> Sorry, go back to sleep. I know about a number of Amazon products, <laughs> oh, including shoot. the Echo Frames, the Echo Loop, and the Nebula Soundbar. Just wait. My Echo Auto in my car goes off whenever anyone on my podcast. Now, it didn't used to affect me in a car, but now it does with uh, with Echo Auto. Uh, Amazon. Okay. But um, uh, Sarah was trying to turn some of the lights on and off, and this goes back to the Hub Attack conversation that we had, or, or stop some music. And, man, Alexa was just – I'm sorry. The Amazon device was just not responding very well. And – I never put two and two together that it was because we had terrible upload speed. Mm -hmm. And so I was having to go out and of course that, that was being restricted. Right. So she was, she, she was telling me like, gosh, I was had to yell at it. And I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. Well, now we know. And the other cool thing about Ubiquity that they have built into their controller, something that I run. So I use the Ubiquity controller to control my home and two other people who I have set up um, in their homes. And they actually have a Wi-Fi AI, which is kind of a, it's in beta, but what it does is at a certain time, and you can do it daily, weekly, monthly, it will do kind of an, and it'll analyze the area, right? See what other access points, what other Wi-Fi networks are open and using what channels. And it will actually adjust your channels to be the best for that. You know, you can run it daily. So I run mine daily at 3 a.m. Hey, check it because, you know, around here, I think everyone, all of my neighbors must have their set to auto because everyone's channels are changing all the time. Um, so I have mine just set 3 a.m. Hey, do your scan, try and figure it out, do the best. And you can actually give you a log of, hey, this day I changed it to this channel. This day I changed it to this channel. And it's kind of nice to see. So most days uh, I'm at 100%. Sometimes it's only changing the five gigahertz, which actually surprises me. I don't know why it needs to change five gigahertz. Um, I would think that there's so many channels there that I wouldn't have any problems. Um, but it, it does a pretty good job. And you can have it only use 1, 6, and 11 like you should for 2.4 if you are only use 1, 6, and 11, if no one's told you that yet, uh, when you're out there changing your Wi-Fi. But it's great, especially for me, for the people's houses who are I'm not in every day. I don't know. So those little tools do help you monitor it in the slightest. So I agree. Ubiquity is a fantastic choice. I use them for almost everything. Uh, you guys do. I switch back to untangle for the routing features because it's better than their USG. But, uh, but for access points, I, I have two of the AC pros in my home and my house is pretty small, but I did it just cause I can. And I kind of, I needed one in our bedroom. Actually, it's in our bathroom because I was getting really bad Wi-Fi in the bathroom. And you can't have bad Wi-Fi in the bathroom. It just, that just doesn't work. No. So I installed, literally, there's an access point in the bathroom because um, we needed one. So uh, it would, there wasn't any coverage on that side of the house. But, uh, yeah, those little tools in there. I know um, who said Wi-Fi Man 2. That's a great little app for Android yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that Ubiquity puts out. Yeah, no, there, there's some in Jim. Um, uh, to Jesse like, said it. I like um, that app. Cause it's a windows 10 app so you can throw it on a laptop and that but yeah there are some really good um um android based apps you will uh, not find one for ios because they do not give you the the data you need from uh 
from the Wi-Fi network card. Well, it, I have that Surface Pro 3 sitting around. That would be perfect for yeah. that. It would be perfect for that. Yeah. 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 That yeah. kind of troubleshooting would be great. Um, one more, just uh, a, a ubiquity product that doesn't get used a lot. Um, and I like them for a specific reason. Um, these air cubes are a little, they're a different product line within ubiquity. So they're not part of the Unify family. So they actually use their UN, UNMS software management control function. Um, these are um, AC devices. They support PoE. So they look a lot like, you know, something you could put on a table or a shelf, um, but they have to be hardwired. But you know, you're going to have to run power to uh, a mesh device anyway. And I just like the idea of these being able to, you could move them around the house and they don't look awful. You don't have to mount them to a wall or a ceiling like a traditional wireless access point. They have a couple of ethernet ports out the back. And one of those offers PoE uh, pass through. So if you had a camera nearby that you wanted to run off from that as well, uh, and these guys, uh, the AC version sells for like seventy nine dollars. Uh, but oddly enough, uh, Woot seems to end up with them for thirty nine bucks a piece on probably a quarterly basis for whatever reason. So just kind of another twist out there, um, different form factor, slightly different function, um, you know, a little bit of a uh, different twist on the controller aspect of it. Um, I think I threw in the notes uh, as well. There's a, oh yeah, in the notes, I threw a link for comparing Unify and Aircube just uh, from a management and a functionality point of view. Kevin, if we were on our Discord, we have an online deals section in our Discord. I know a lot of these end up over at the Home Service Show forums, reset forums now. Um, yeah, would would that show up? Would, would a Woot deal like this show up from you? Because I know... You're the master at this. Do you post them there when that when they show up? Yeah, actually, the last time this was up on Woot, uh, I did uh, pop it up on the uh, on the Discord site. So, okay. Yep. Good. Try, try. You also got me my twenty uh, my four port gigabit uh, network card. You posted that one. That was a great yeah. snag for twenty five bucks. Those are, those are you know, I keep too much crap around here, but I always seem to go through things like that when I'm playing with stuff or working with things and it's it's just handy and it's, yeah, especially a good uh i think that was an intel if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. for 25 bucks is pretty hard to beat i i even got some old school i think this was you that posted it but i got some old school craftsman screwdrivers for 20 bucks yes that that was you yeah. right yep. yeah and actually i got them for a buddy of mine he was getting married and he has he has no tools uh. like none <laughs> and he was trying to put together this arch thing for his own wedding and he was just having a hell of a time. And I was like, dude, well, don't you have any tools? Like, no, I don't have any tools. Like, millennials don't own tools. <laughs> they don't own any tools. We post like them on our podcast over here. <laughs> I mean, except Weaker. Yeah. But uh, so I bought them. Uh, it was 20 bucks. And uh, so I picked those up as a uh, as an early wedding gift for him. So, Kevin, thanks for, for posting. Speaking of deals, if I was going to do 10 gig on the cheap, are, are there some things I could do? I mean, how do I do today 10 gig on the cheap? Um, so kind of depends on you know, finding finding the points. So um, Mellanox uh, 10 gig uh, Ethernet cards that are the SFP. So you'd need the transceivers for them. Those go for 30, 35 bucks on eBay kind of all day long. Okay. Um, they're usually branded Dell or HP, but... Um, there's plenty of you can you can go right to Mellanox and get the latest firmware to turn them back into a Mellanox card. Okay, so those and then the the device that Uyghurs already bought, right? <laughs> it, the stuff for seventy five bucks. Yeah, if you I need one of those. If you're into so that'd be the switch on the other end, and you'd want to switch with some ten gig ports, um, depending on what you needed. So the the Aruba that I threw up there, uh, obviously one of the drawbacks is that's an enterprise switch, so it's going to be a little loud. Although the, once it settles down after boot up, it's not too terribly loud, and that gives you four ten gig SFP ports. Okay. So then you get down to you know distance. How far away are you running devices will affect what you want to do. Um, that that Netgear switch that we talked about way early in the show, 
that could be a really cost effective way to jump into um, 10 gig as well because it has two 10 gig ports on it one of them sfp and one rj45 so then it comes down to what kind of card do you have in the pc some of these um, server boards from uh, AS Rock Rack or Asus or Gigabit come with a 10 gig port down on them. Uh, usually it's SFP. So you, you kind of have to play it around a little bit. You can save a bunch of money on the Switch and then end up spending way too much money on Ethernet cards. Um, I will throw out just to be careful um, when it comes to 10 gig Ethernet, yes, when it comes to 10 gig <laughs> Ethernet, um, don't make any assumptions. Um, I tore apart an old server one time, had a couple of 10 gig cards in it. And I thought, Hey, I'll just keep those around. And you know, in case I you want to play with 10 gig on them, they were older Intel cards and uh, drivers stopped at uh, server 2003 or something. Oh, oh interesting. Wow. Okay. So we, we get so used to grabbing any gigabit ethernet card, plugging it in and it works with any operating system. Some of the early 10 gig stuff doesn't work with anything anymore. So even before, Linux, there might be some Linux variants for them. Uh, okay. That's probably more likely, but always, uh, always kind of go through the numbers and see, uh, see what you need to do. The other thing about 10 gig, uh, I mentioned QLogic. Um, QLogic is selling some switches and they have some very affordable, I'm sorry, not QLogic, um, QNAP. So QNAP has some very affordable switches that support 10 gig. Um, can be an easy way to jump into things uh, there as well. All right. I, I sense, I smell Uyghur's spending money this weekend it's it's not good i know that's, that's why i was just actually looking at it right now i'm looking it over because i was going back to the viewings because i was doing the same thing you just told me not to do i was actually looking on ebay for just any 10 gig card for uh the main machine here in unraid to go along with the new 10 gigabit switch um <laughs> trying to add up see how much the toy would cost but now i got to make sure those will actually work uh, Mel Melanox is a pretty safe choice. Uh, their families are numbered. So the Connect X3 is a couple years old, few years old, but th that's still really well supported. And so we, have I'm just, we have a link for that in the show notes. I'm just shocked at the price on the Arubas um, on, on how low they are. I mean, there's a couple on eBay. If you filter it by zero to a hundred dollars, mm -hmm. there are quite a few. And I just did POE even. I mean, those are POE managed switches. Yep. And with the 10 gig in there for 69 bucks is the one I was looking at. Yep. So yeah. the, the S3500 uh, is a little newer. Um, I have an S2500 I use for a lab uh, switch down the basement. Um, works uh, quite well. And, um, you know, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's surprising the price is that low on them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so you said that some of their members had to trick it and say, hey, you're, those 10 gig ports are not uplinks anymore. So can it switch, though, at 10 gigabit with yes. those four? Yep. Okay. Yep. So you could have four 10 gigabit devices around and it'll switch at that speed. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. And, and yeah, full, full, um, yeah, I believe it's full non blocking on those because they're traditionally used for um, stacking. So uh, the 10 gig ports, okay. I, think the, I think the whole switch is non blocking. But if you go. Now that's to, a new word for me. What does non blocking mean? Non blocking means that every port can support its full bandwidth. Got um, it. Okay. Almost. Almost all your new switches are full non-blocking throughout. Back in the olden days when you opened up a switch and there were lots of different chips in there, sometimes if you had ports on, a certain set of ports were on one chip, another set of ports were on another chip, and there was linkage between those, um, you'd run into uh, th uh, basically throttling issues or you wouldn't be able to see um, full bandwidth across the switch. So if you loaded down all the ports, had stuff plugged into all of them, you would not get full throughput on all of them. Got it. All right. Sarah, now my came, wheels are churning. <laughs> Sarah came around the corner the, just a few minutes ago. She's like, are you podcasting? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, you're really quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, uh, I don't have a lot to say on this one. Kevin, let me, I will ask you this question. If we did a home server show meetup today, we haven't, course so i haven't done those in a while but you always used to bring some gear to those if we were going to have one today what would you bring what kind of gear would you bring to the home server show meetup um uh, if i was showing up today mm -hmm. i would probably bring um so 
still a fan of the little microservers. Uh, mm -hmm. HP is just going through a transition. The microserver Gen 10 was not as popular as the Gen 8. Uh, they went to an AMD chip in it and they dropped the ILO function from it. But um, I think it's still a very good performance box uh, for the price you pay. And actually what I've been playing with on that is, uh, so Unraid, I always end up thinking of Unraid as an easy way to run lots of drives. I wanna run a whole bunch of drives. But the nice thing with these little microservers is there's four hard drive bays on the front and there's a 16 uh, or a by eight slot on the motherboard. So what I've been playing with and the, the cheapest license for Unraid is the, um, uh, is the um, six drive. So what I have in there is four hard drives, um, a uh, M.2 NVMe uh, SSD, and then another SATA SSD. So two SATA SSD, uh, SATA SSD, NVMe SSD uh, in that slot, and then four drives up front. That's my six drives. And I've just been playing around with that, seeing what the performance looks like, what it feels like. Um, and, and that would be one that I would bring to that. If you flip that picture back up again, if we, if we were doing this, um, so they just introduced the Gen 10 Plus, which they're going back to um, Intel for the chipset, comes with a Xeon chip. Um, the hard drives are um, mounted, the, yeah, instead of uh, ver vertically, they're horizontal now. So this box, instead of being nine inches tall, it's four inches tall. So it's a tiny little server. Um, they pulled the power supply out of it. It uh, uses an external power supply now. Um, Pricing is going to be higher because they uh, went back to putting uh, the ILO chip in there for remote access. Um, but uh, don't have one of these yet. But uh, there, you kind of look at the back of it. It's uh, quad Ethernet built in, and they use the really good Intel chip. So this could be a really neat box for somebody who, you know, a small office. Um, they want to run like an Untangle in it with backup software and other things to put it together as one complete system. Um, could be a nice little virtualization box. Um, I'm also thinking these might, you know, back towards the end of the Gen 8 HP, a lot of guys were using that as a uh, VMware um, training, you know, home lab kind of deal. I think this could get you back into kind of a good VMware home lab because it'll have 32 gig of memory possible, a um, little limited on disk space. So you have to kind of make your choices wisely there. But um, you know, it could be good support from that point of view. You, you put some, you could put some big spinners in there too, right? Yeah. Yep. If you wanted to, I mean, you could do twelve or fourteen terabyte. If you yep. want to do it that way, right? You can fill it up with big drives. So four in there. What's do you know what these are retailing for right now? Uh, they have not started shipping yet, and the list prices were really high okay. six seven hundred dollars, something like that. And traditionally, we're used to microservers being in the three to four hundred kind of range. So we'll have to see what the pricing comes out. Yeah, I was, I was thinking a thousand when you were the way you were talking so to think yeah, I, I think one of the higher end units of these fully loaded with memory will probably be pushing close to a grand okay yeah once you start putting drives and and other pieces in there right yep so, absolutely we uh we're running a little short on time even though you can podcast forever i do try to keep these to about an hour 20 uh kevin anything else you want to throw in there not not offhand i threw in um uh, a link to one of my favorite software companies, Paragon. Uh, they still have their set of um, free things you can get from them. They're, if you if you prefer a traditional backup and recovery kind of package, um, they have uh, that available yet. Um, the one I haven't played with yet, if you see on the screen there, is something called Image Mounter. It was kind of put together for IT help desk kind of folks to be able to grab up images off laptops and mount them on another system. So if you had the user had a crash system and you had a backup of it, you could grab that and run it as a VM. Um, their rescue kit is free. That includes um, some, some of their uh, file recovery products. And then the uh, good old partition manager that they've offered for a lot of years, they have a community version of that. So if you run into, um, issues with um uh partition management functions and are these all free these are, are all community free. their community editions are free everything is free here uh everything on this page is free yeah okay. they still have a lot of software they sell 
Uh, and for people who dabble in Macs, kind of a mixed world of Mac, um, these were the guys who I always found had a product that would let you run uh, Mac formatted drives or Mac file systems on Windows PCs. So I'm not seeing that right now, but um, they always had something like that. How would you rate their backup and recovery versus an Acronis or a Veeam or a Ease Us is one of those we've been working with. That they have a $30 solution. What would you, it's super simple, by the way, but how would you rate this, the, the Paragon? Uh, very, very functional. Uh, you can back up to an image. You can back up uh, just a regular file store. Um, you can turn an image into a VM. So if you want to make it portable and take it other places. My big issue with these guys, and I, I say this with all due respect, is they're a German-based company. So the user's manual for the backup and recovery software is 175 pages. <laughs> So there, so there, there, there can be a little learning curve with it. But, That's uh, so great. Oh, you, you'd expect it, right? Yeah, you I mean, have to. I, yeah. I've, worked, you know, I've dealt with these guys for a lot of years, and oh you God. just kind of expect that from them. No, it's great. It's precision, right? Well, Kevin, thanks for – that's very thorough. I would expect nothing less. I think – you may you you may be close to the record setter for number of times on Home Gadget Geeks non regular host. Hey, yeah, uh, I'll look for yeah. my gold jacket. My... I'll buy a T-shirt or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got one of those too. Yeah. So, uh, well, like I said earlier, Kevin, I, I've appreciated your willingness to be a part of this community. You know, you you start doing these things, and you have no idea the kind of the impact over time it's going to have, and. It's just amazing to me. We've been doing this as a community for at least a decade, um, a little bit longer for some of some of us um, in there. And I just really appreciate your willingness to to share and to come on and to keep coming on and and uh, to be a big part of this community and being so generous. So so again, thanks for coming on and, and being really really helpful out there, not just with deals, but with parts and how to get them and where to get them and what's the best place to get them. I'm sure Uyghur wears you out on some of those things. A little it's, bit, a little bit. I was going to say, uh, you know how interested I am because if I get really quiet towards the end, it's because I got three different sharp shopping carts already full. I've got some research pages open. So like I'm already like, oh man, everything you've said tonight has been right up my alley of something I've been looking into. It's uh, It was such good information. Really appreciate it. That's okay. fun. I, I enjoy um um, it's kind of that knowledge transfer, helping people learn. And, yeah. you know, I think if you help folks, uh, figure out where to get information and how to do things themselves, it helps them out and they can help other people out. So it's just, uh, it, it is a community and that's what I have always enjoyed about this group. Looking at that old home tech 107, when we did those kind of round tables, I need to pull that back. I need to, that Mike, we, as we think about maybe in the late summer, early fall, get some topics and just say, you know, uh, you know, storage and networking and maybe good just to come in and have folks explain their home networks. That would be a ton of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Know that we, we should, we should resurrect that again and, and, uh, and pull that together. So Kevin, thanks for coming out. A couple of reminders as we kind of wrap uh, things up here. One is don't forget uh, tweet out IC doc USA, all one word at IC doc USA. Let them know you're a fan of the show. Make sure you copy me at Jay Collison on it. You can send them anything. A few of you did that uh, during the show. Tony, want to thank you for doing that. Uh, Joe got that done. Mike did it as well. Um, still not too late for folks that are on here live. If you want to do that before the end of the night, that uh, uh, maybe we could uh, do some interesting things with them. So I appreciate you um, getting out there. If it's after the fact, just send it when you have some time. I uh, appreciate you doing that. And, and getting that over to him. You never know what kind of thing, uh, how that's going to make. We we mentioned the Discord group, so the averageguy.tv slash Discord will get you in there if you're like, oh, where are these amazing deals? Well, they're in the show notes, so make sure you go to the averageguy.tv slash HGG434 for this show. They'll be out there, um, and you can get them from there. I want to thank everybody who supports us on Patreon, The Average Guy. if you want to do that, the averageguy.tv slash Patreon. Um, you know, if I do a deal with uh, IC Doc, they won't be able to necessarily provide all the par all the parts, and I'll need to buy some of those. So your support through Patreon helps me do that, and appreciate that as well. Um, remember, you can send us an email, Jim at the Average Guy TV. I mentioned you can track me down on Twitter at Jay Collison. Um, Mike, what's your Twitter? 
at Uyghur Tech. At Uyghur Tech, this easy. Kevin, are you on? You're on. You're, I'm on you're, Twitter. I never remember my Twitter, though. I think it's Schoon1979, if I'm not mistaken. I think. Let's let's get that really fast, because I know you were tweeted before the show. Schoon Doggy, 19, there you go. 1979. There you go. Um, and so you can follow us all that way if you want to get that done. Don't forget the average guy.tv, both web and media hosting powered by Maple Grove Partners. Get secure, reliable, high-speed hosting from people that you know and you trust. Speaking of high-speed, Christian's been upgrading the infrastructure there at Maple Grove and is now going to have a live failover uh, of sort. And so that's an enterprise that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. You can say you were on it when it was just Christian and his dad and uh, plans as little as $10 a month. A great way to get it done. Check out maplegrovepartners.com. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Don't forget, come out and join us live sometime. If you're maybe you're a regular listener to the podcast, and if you've got this far, you wow, like wow, you're the real deal. Seriously, <laughs> come join us live. This is a ton of fun. Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out at the average guy.tv slash live. We'd love to have you. The regulars are out there. Nobody will, everybody will welcome you. And so we love to have you. Thanks to Tony and Joe and Alex and Ron and uh, Tony and Brian. And I think I got them all. Ryan, uh, Ryan was out here a little bit earlier. By the way, they're coming back on. Ryan and Bob coming back on here in a couple weeks uh, after the big fail. I uh, want to thank you for joining us tonight. With that, uh, if you're listening live, stay around for the post show. With that, we'll say goodbye.